And these uh, uncorrelated uh, sites have an energy epsilon p, and we have a, a hybridization amplitude v of p, which uh, describes the, the hopping <coughs> uh, from the impurity to this uh, bath level. So the Hamiltonian is given by this. We have a local part plus a bath plus the hybridization part. And the local part describes this uh, correlated site. So u times n up and down minus mu times n up plus n down. The bath is the, describes all these non-interacting um, bath levels. And I write the <coughs> creation operators for the bath as C operators. Like this. And then we have the hybridization term which describes the exchange of electrons between the impurity and the bath. The bath, uh, uh, sorry, the impurity uh, operators, annihilation operators, I write as D. Now let me check the signs. Okay, I think I put the, I put the emission. So like this. And now, the basic strategy is to uh, switch to an interaction representation in which the time evolution of operators is given by these two terms. Uh, the local part and the bath part, and then uh, expand the partition function in powers of this hybridization part, and then uh, uh, sample these, uh, these configurations which we get by expanding these partition functions, or the partition function. So, so basically we now uh, switch to an interaction representation which the time evolution of operators looks as follows. We have some time dependent operator O with the time dependence given by E to the uh, tau H local plus H bath O e to the minus tau. like this. Now we write the a partition function of this impurity model as follows. This is the trace over the impurity operators or the impurity states, trace over the bath states, and then <coughs> E to the minus beta log plus h bath, and then a time ordering uh, operator, and then uh, like this. So this is now the expression for the partition function in this uh, uh, interaction representation, and now uh, we expand. So probably there's a minus sign here. We expand uh, this exp time time ordered exponential in powers of this uh, hybridization term, and so what this gives us is an expression of the following form. 
we have um, write it like this. So we have n integrals at order n. Well, let's uh, actually go up to 2n. As I will explain in a minute, we will only have even perturbation orders in this uh, type of expansion. And then we have the trace over d, the trace over the C, and then E to the minus E star. Path, time order product. Let's maybe time order them already. So we have two n, something like this. Okay. And now what we recognize here. are um, on the left hand side this is just something like a sum over configurations and these configurations correspond to uh, time points on the imaginary time interval. So a configuration C is a collection of time points on the imaginary time interval. We could, in principle, uh, represent it by dots, like this. Tau n to tau 2n, like this. <coughs> so this is our configuration space, the space of all collections of time points on the imaginary time interval. And then on the right-hand side, we uh, recognize the expression for the weight of this expression, uh, of this configuration here. So that's some weight of, a con of this configuration C. It's given by this uh, product of uh, the tau factors times some trace of a product of uh, hybridization operators. And that's the weight of this configuration C. And so now we have uh, defined the configuration space in which we want to, to work. That's the space of all uh, collections of time points. We have defined the weight of each of these configurations and now we can in principle uh, implement a Monte Carlo procedure which uh, randomly or stochastically samples all these collection of time points according to uh, these weights and that's uh, the idea of these continuous time uh, Monte Carlo algorithms and in the particular case of this hybridization expansion, the weight is given by this expression. So that's basically the, the, the whole idea. What I want to do now is discuss in more details what uh, this expression is for the specific case of the Anderson impurity model and then uh, how this sampling is, is done in practice. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, you, you want to know if this is, is, is known? No. Uh, if it's small? In principle, it doesn't matter if it's... Yes, of course, yeah. Of course, the, the most important perturbation orders will <laughs> depend on the strength of the hybridization. So if the hybridization is uh, strong, this Monte Carlo sampling process will produce uh, configurations which have a relatively high order. Whereas if the hybridization is weak, as is the case in an insulator, for example, then the Monte Carlo sampling will produce uh, configurations which have a small uh, perturbation order. Uh, I think that because since the main series is <coughs> yes. is it expansion in some orders of hybridization? Or is it expansion? Yeah, it's an expansion, but we... Uh, we treat all, all the terms in the expansion, so it's not an approximation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is an a priori reason, and I will actually, I will discuss what is the physical meaning of the average perturbation order. So there's a very uh, simple interpretation, and that's the uh, kinetic energy of the system at least in a DMFT context. And so the kinetic energy is not infinite. Uh, so, um, yeah, basically the, one can understand why these uh, orders are finite. Okay, good. So then, um, so then let me proceed uh, with the a discussion of this Anderson <laughs> impurity model. So one thing which I have already done here is I have only uh, considered even perturbation orders because, yeah, in order to have a non-zero trace, we we need uh, an even number of terms because each hybridization operator changes the number of electrons on the impurity by plus or minus one, and so to have a non-zero trace, we need to get back to the same number of electrons on the impurity, and that's only possible for an for a even uh, number of uh, hybridization operators. So, and actually there's uh, there are more, more simplifications. For example, we can write this hybridization operator as the sum of uh, a term which has a, a creation operator for the D electron and a term which has an annihilation operator. So the term with the annihilation operator is this one which annihilates an impurity electron and uh, let, let, lets the impurity electron hop into the bath. And then there's another term which uh, describes the inverse process. And so basically what we need in order to have a non-zero trace is an even number of uh, operators which have a D and a, or the same number of D and D dagger operators. So among these two N operators, we need N of this uh, kind and n of uh, this type. So, so we need oh I see I have <coughs> I've forgotten something here actually there's a factor 1 over 2n factorial from, from the expansion of the, because I haven't time ordered, I haven't time ordered yet the, uh, the integrals. <coughs> so 
because now I need this uh, guy. So how many uh, combinations or possibilities do we have to uh, distribute these D and D dagger operators among these two N uh, operators? There are uh, two N factorial divided by N factorial times N factorial possibilities uh, to distribute these operators. So what we uh, end up with is something like this. So we can uh, write this partition function as the sum of n of zero to infinity and then we have two types of uh, time integrals. We have n for the creation operators and another n for the annihilation operators. Well, let's Then we have a one over n factorial squared. Trace D, trace And we have always uh, a pair like this, minus h like this. So these are our 2n operators now written explicitly as a, a crea impurity creation and uh, annihilation terms. Yes? Yeah, yeah, we can drop, yeah. At the, already at this point we can drop the negative sign, yeah. So this negative sign, because we have even uh, orders uh, can be dropped right away. Okay, so now this, this is always the case for any kind of impurity uh, model. But in the case of this Anderson impurity model, there's an additional uh, constraint, namely this time evolution, which is given by H local plus H bus does not have any spin flip terms, so it doesn't uh, rotate the spin. So this means that, in fact, for each spin separately, we need the same number of creation and annihilation operators. So that's an additional constraint. So, so for the Anderson impurity model, we need same number of uh, d dagger sigma and d sigma for, for each spin sigma. So that's, that's for models which do not have any uh, terms in the local Hamiltonian that can flip the spin. And this gives us another, another uh, a simplification. We can now uh, distribute the n creation operators among n up 
and n down uh, creation operators for spin up and spin down. So n uh, becomes n up plus n down. And so uh, if we think about these uh, combinatorics of how uh, many possibilities we have to distribute the creation and annihilation operators. Now, among these uh, spin components, we find that we have to replace them, or that we have n, n factorial divided by n up factorial times n down factorial uh, possibilities. Okay, and if we now do this, then we If we do this, we end up with a, a <clears throat> relatively lengthy expression. So I will now uh, introduce these, uh, these spin-dependent uh, terms. And at the same time, I will now replace these hybridization terms by their explicit expression with, in terms of these V uh, amplitudes. That is then the following following lengthy expression for the partition function. So we have the sum over all sort of uh, collections of uh, perturbation orders for the different spin components. Then we have a product over the spin components and then an integral over times for the up and down uh, for the creation and annihilation operators for these spin components. And these are right like this. So here I have now time ordered uh, these integrals and dropped these factorials what we uh, certainly can do. So this is for the annihilation operators and then we have a similar uh, bunch of integrals for the creation operators which I uh, denote by the t tau prime variables. Okay, these are the uh, time integrals and then I have this trace over the D states, trace over the C states, e to the minus beta. And now within uh, Within this uh, time ordered uh, product, I can also separate everything into spin uh, components because there are always two operators, two fermionic operators associated with each time. So I can write the product over spin components, and now I insert the explicit expressions for these uh, hybridization operators, and this gives me then um, <coughs> basically many. Uh, sums over these uh, quantum numbers uh, P, which uh, label the, the different uh, bath states. 
So I have a sum of P1 sigma to Pn sigma. These are the, the quantum numbers of the bath. something similar for the uh, for these other terms which are associated with the creation operators and then a, a long product of these hybridization fact uh, amplitudes like this and now a product over uh, all these uh, hopping terms between the impurity and the path so that is C dagger sigma P and sigma tau So these are uh, two such hybridization terms, one with a D operator and one with a D dagger operator. And then we have for each time we have a <coughs> product of, uh, of such uh, operators. Okay, that's it. So, hmm. okay. So at this uh, stage, it looks pretty uh, messy, but it's useful to uh, draw a little picture what this means. So let us uh, draw here the picture of this imaginary time interval, which runs from zero to time beta, we have a certain number of impurity creation and annihilation operators on this interval. For example, we have a, say a D dagger up operator here and a D up operator here. And we may have a D down operator here. Say a D dagger down operator here. And now at each position where there is a D creation or annihilation operator, there is also an associated bath annihilation or creation operator. So with this guy, we have an annihilation operator in the bath associated with it, and with this annihilation operator, we have a creation operator in the bath uh, associated with this uh, D operator. So if we uh, write the bath operators in uh, orange here, we can write it like this. So this would be C up P1 prime up. And this would be C dagger down, P one down. This would be something like C dagger up, P one up. And so forth. 
this would be C uh, down. P1 prime down. And the time evolution from one operator to the next one, like this. So the time evolution here, if I draw it like this, is from right to left. And the time evolution is given by this here. E to the minus delta tau times h local plus h bar. So it's E to the minus delta tau So that's uh, what we find after uh, this expansion. Sorry? Ah, this, this picture, what it means? Yeah, okay, so if you, if you look at this line here, we have a a product of uh, operators. And now you see that for each time, we have two operators. We have an impurity <coughs> operator and a bath operator. And there's always an impurity creation operator and a bath annihilation operator, or there's an impurity annihilation <coughs> operator and a bath uh, creation operator. So these are these uh, pairs of operators, which I have now drawn here by circles or squares. So circle means up. So a full circle is a creation operator for spin up. An empty circle is an annihilation operator for spin up. A full square is a creation operator for spin down. And an empty square is an annihilation operator for spin down. So like this, we can just uh, I mean, yeah, what this picture just shows is how the electrons in hop in and out of the impurity. So here, an uh, electron hops in from the bath from this particular level onto the impurity. And here, the electron hops out into this uh, bath state and so forth. So I hope that's more or less clear. Yes, yes. Yeah, this, yeah. So the implicit uh, uh, thing which is not uh, written is that from one operator to the next, you have a time propagation with this operator. And that comes from basically from the <coughs> definition of this uh, time dependence of the operators. Okay, so, so now the nice uh, thing is that once we have expanded everything in the hybridization term, there is no coupling between the impurity and the bath anymore in the time dependence. So the only term which couples the impurity and the bath is the hybridization. But once we expand in the hybridization, there's no coupling between the impurity and the bath anymore. So the, so in this expression now, the impurity and the bath, they, they live in different worlds. So what we can do is we can separate all the impurity-related operators and uh, all the bath-related operators and compute uh, this trace separately for the impurity and the bath. And that's what we are now uh, going to do. Yeah, of course, there are signs, yeah. That's, that's the only place, because all these weights are otherwise positive, right? I mean, they will not give you any signs. And that's yeah. the sign problem comes from that. Mm. So there are certain loops here, right? So you can start here. Yes, start. yes. Of course, these, uh, if you express these now as matrices, yeah, they, they will have some signs. And this time ordering, I mean, we have a time ordering operator, which is supposed to time order all of this, will also produce uh, anti-commutation signs.
Oh. Where from the signs of the storm can be equal with the severe with the Yeah, I will if Yeah, I, I plan to discuss the sign problem. And actually for the Anderson impurity model one can show that this has no sign problem. And it's an interesting proof, actually. Very simple, but, but interesting. So I'll try to do that. So the symmetric. Or just any, uh, yeah. But for more complicated uh, models, it's, this proof doesn't work, so. Anyhow, so the next thing in order to simplify uh, this expression is that we separate the impurity and the bath and treat, uh, compute these traces over the impurity and the bath uh, state separately. So maybe I should uh, write this. So basically for the impurity, we then get something like this, a trace over D. And now I just write it in this sort of simplified picture where we have this collection of uh, impurity operators And the time evolution between two operators is now given only by the local part. While for the bus, looks uh, at the moment still quite complicated because all we can uh, we have all these uh, sums over the different uh, bath uh, states uh, in the trace over the bath so just write it like this so all the p quantum numbers the p prime quantum numbers then we have this v star P one sigma V P one prime sigma to V star. And then again pictorially uh, the corresponding sequence over the bath uh, states. Now it's something like this. Well, these have now uh, some uh, quantum numbers uh, associated with, with them. So like C up, P1 prime up, and so forth. And now here the time evolution from one uh, operator to the next one is given by the bath only. So E to the minus delta tau H 
dollars. And so then we can write here one or the partition function of the bath times the partition function of the bath. And then what we have here is a expectation value uh, for some uh, endpoint uh, correlation function for the non-interacting problem here with only the bath. And as you have seen in several uh, lectures already, there is now a weak theorem which allows us to exactly uh, evaluate this type of uh, uh, expectation values. And what it will uh, give us in the end is some, so here we use now Wix theorem. This will give us some determinant of an n by n matrix. So that's more or less what we, what we can uh, expect. And the only question now is to figure out, <coughs> or the only problem is to figure out what is exactly this matrix here. And to do uh, that, it's useful to consider the simplest case, where we have only, say, one creation and annihilation operator. I have the lowest, lowest non-trivial order in this expansion. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, since I have a product over sigma there uh, in the diagram, should I have only one kind of, uh, means only uh, sigma or? No, actually you're right. There's, there's a, a, it also factorizes in spin. So there's a product over two. So in the diagram, I uh, may just represent uh, the states by sigma only, not by up and down separately, because then it will create confusion, is it? Ah, here, yeah, here's a sigma, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So everything uh, actually factorizes into spin up and spin down. So this, so this determinant will be block diagonal. And there's a spin up uh, block and a spin down block. And in the impurity thing, uh, should there also we have a, a product over sigma or? Uh, no, 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 here okay. not, yeah. Uh, here we cannot. Uh, factorize into sigma. Because this, we, this is now just some uh, sequence of operators with up and down uh, uh, spin. And we just explicitly need to uh, compute this trace. And this trace calculation cannot be uh, factorized. And I will, ex because there is interaction between the uh, up and down spin. I will, I will discuss later how we, how we do this. But so let's first uh, try to figure out what, what this determinant is. So, so we consider the lowest uh, order. Namely, n sigma is 1 and n sigma bar, so that's the other spin, is zero. <coughs> then, what we have to compute is something like this. Sum over p1, sum over p1 prime, v p1 star, v p1 prime, and then one over c bar, trace, C to the minus theta path. Therefore, P one So that's the expression for the lowest uh, perturbation order for uh, this path contribution. And so first we have to uh, say what is the partition function for the bath. This can be expressed uh, simply as follows. It's a product of uh, sigma, a product of all the quantum numbers p, and then e to the minus epsilon p beta 
plus 1. And what this is, is um, the 1 is the contribution of the MTP state to this uh, partition function that just gives 1. And the e to the minus epsilon p beta is the contribution of the occupied uh, p state. Uh, to the partition function because the, the bath is just sum over p, epsilon p, n of p, right? So, so the bath, h bath, sum over p, epsilon p, c there, got p, c, p. So if the... Uh, level is occupied, it has an energy epsilon p, otherwise it's, it's zero. So the bath uh, partition function is like this. And <coughs> using that, we can now uh, write uh, explicitly uh, this uh, trace here as follows. So more p1. One to the minus epsilon one beta plus one, and then there are two possibilities e to the minus one to one. like this. So first of all, uh, to have a non-zero trace, the P1 prime quantum number must be the same as the P1 quantum number so that uh, sum collapses to one sum over one set of quantum numbers, V1, and then V star V is just the uh, module of uh, V P1 squared. And then this denominator comes from uh, basically the partition function of the bar. So that's the only factor which doesn't uh, cancel. And the nominator is the following. Uh, so here, this is for the case where tau prime is bigger than tau. So tau one sigma is uh, oh. Like this, if tau one sigma is bigger than tau one prime sigma, and this is if tau one sigma is smaller than tau one prime sigma, and the, the reason is the following. So let's uh, consider the case where the creation operator for, or oh, sorry, where the annihilation operator comes before the creation operator for the bath, then we have a sort of occupation which evolves like this. So we have tau one uh, prime tau one like this. And here we have the annihilation operator C and here we have the creation operator C. There go and so the time interval in which this bath level is op occupied is then beta minus T1 minus T1 prime. So that gives this uh, exponent. And in the other case, <coughs> we have a situation like this, where we have uh, tau 1 here and tau 1 prime here. And then uh, the time interval in which the bath level is occupied is tau 1 prime minus tau 1. And we get the minus sign because of this uh, time ordering operator. We have to commute these two uh, operators and that's, so that's uh, the result. And now you have to tell me if you know what this function is. Does anybody know what this is? Well, 
then maybe we should do a Fourier transform of this expression. And after the Fourier transform, Yeah, hmm. well, anyhow, let's do the, after Fourier transform, one finds sum over P1, we P1 squared over I, omega n minus epsilon p1. So that you can easily do as a little exercise to the Fourier transform of this. And now do you recognize this uh, expression here? So this is the so-called hybridization function, right? You have seen in uh, Ortoan's lectures. So this is, um, we typically call delta i omega n, and that's the hybridization function. So this expression here is the imaginary time uh, expression of the hybridization function. So this thing here uh, is delta sigma tau 1 prime minus tau 1, and that's the hybridization function. So we have found that uh, <clears throat> in the lowest order case, after tracing out this path, we find the hybridization function from one uh, time to the, to the other. And uh, now you can repeat this uh, calculation for the second order. That will be a, a homework. And once you have done this homework, it's pretty easy to guess how uh, this generalizes to arbitrary orders. Namely, the generalization to higher orders is as follows. Is that one? Or C bath trace or C times this whole uh, thing, which I I uh, wrote here, gives the product of two determinants of a matrix which I call M sigma minus one for historical reasons. And the elements of this M sigma minus one matrix, M sigma minus one IJ, so that's IJ element of this matrix M sigma one is nothing else than the hybridization function for spin sigma evaluated at tau uh, i prime, tau i prime minus tau j. So tau i prime is the time position of the creation operator, impurity creation operator number i and tau j is the position, time position of the annihilation operator number j. So this uh, defines uh, this matrix, and with this we have taken care of our bath. And <coughs> the, that simplifies the expression very much. And so after having traced out the bath, we can then parameterize our configurations as follows. So 
So configuration C is a collection of time points, as I said, but we have, <coughs> yes? Uh-huh, okay. So tau I prime. So that's the time of the, of the D dagger operator number I and tau J is the time of the D operator number J. So the, yeah. So you have a N creation and N annihilation operators and they have times tau one to tau n and tau one prime to tau n prime. And so these are the. That means at tau i prime, I'm creating electron on impurity, means I'm annihilating from the box, right? That's yes. And the tau j, you uh, annihilate it on the impurity and it hops back into the box. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um, exactly. So once you have traced out the bath, you will. Mm, okay, so, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so you're asking for the connection to the non-crossing approximation. There is a way to add, there is a way to yeah. add a rule on the tau A and tau J. When yes. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about these determinants is that they sum up n factorial diagrams. So a determinant of, of a matrix of size n times n has n factorial terms. And each of these terms corresponds to a specific diagram in this strong coupling expansion. And some of these diagrams have crossing hybridization lines and some have non-crossing hybridization lines. And so what Thomas uh, discussed yesterday is an approximation where you only treat the non-crossing ones, but here through this uh, determinant uh, formalism, you can in a quite <coughs> efficient way uh, treat all, all the diagrams and actually in such a way that all sign cancellations are taken care of uh, properly. Yeah, for example, if you have a, <coughs> let's take the case of a two by two a hybridization matrix. Um, basically what you have is something like, let's call it delta one, 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 delta one, one, delta two, two, delta one, two, Delta two one, and what is this? So now the determinant has two terms. The determinant, if you take the determinant of this matrix, you get delta one one, delta two two minus delta two one, delta <laughs> one two, like this. And these two terms now correspond to two diagrams. So we have, uh, Uh, this is delta one one, delta two two. But then we also have this guy. Uh, so these two are summed up into this two by two determinant. And okay, this both of these are in the NCA. But if you go to third order you will find the first diagram which is not in NCA anymore. Yeah, so that's uh, briefly the connection to, to NCA. 
Anyhow, I, I wanted to explain uh, how our configuration uh, space uh, can now be uh, parametrized. It's parametrized by time points, but uh, we have <coughs> now n time points for So we have n up creation operators for up. We have n up annihilation operators. Uh, sorry, n up uh, annihilation operators, n up creation operators for up, and n down annihilation operators for down, and n down creation operators for down. So this is. Um, the configuration space and the weight of this configuration is now on the one hand this impurity contribution plus the determinant of hybridization matrices. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No? Yeah. Okay, like this. Okay. The weight <coughs> is Trace over D, D And we also have this something like this. So this is after having traced out the bath, our expression for our expression for a specific uh, Monte Carlo configuration consisting of n up. Uh, creation and annihilation operators for spin up and then down creation and annihilation operators for spin <coughs> down. And so you see that <coughs> this determinant of this hybridization matrix takes care of everything that has to do with the bath. And what remains now is to compute uh, this uh, impurity contribution. So that's the impurity contribution That is the bath contribution. Okay, now um, mm -hmm. I will discuss this uh, so-called segment uh, picture, which Michel has alluded to yesterday, uh, which allows us to quite efficiently evaluate this local uh, impurity contribution. This, D tau, yeah, uh, <clears throat> right from the uh, if we do this expansion, we have these uh, integrals or time points, and for each integral, we have a D, D tau infinitesimal quantity D tau, and uh, this belongs to the weight. 
of the Monte Carlo configuration. And so it looks a little bit uh, a little bit strange at first that you have these infinitesimals in the weight, which <coughs> furthermore depend on the order. But we will see that once you define your Monte Carlo sampling procedure by uh, writing down the detailed balance condition properly, these the tau factors will, will cancel out. And so the, the sampling procedure is all defined in terms of nice uh, finite uh, transition probabilities. But uh, properly speaking, at this level, the d tau factors must be uh, part of the weight. Hmm. Okay, but now let's uh, discuss this uh, segment configuration. Namely, we can re represent this uh, configuration C by a collection of segments. And we let's uh, draw two time intervals like this. So here's time zero. Here is imaginary time beta. And let us put four operators. So this is spin up and spin down. Let us put four operators like this on the up. And two operators for the downspin like this. So here we have a d dagger up, here we have a d up, d dagger up, d up, d dagger down, like this. So if we want to have a non-zero trace, we have to come in here with an empty uh, up uh, with an orbital which is not occupied by an up electron. So here we have number of up electrons must be zero at time zero. Then uh, up electron hops in, and then n up will be one. Then it will go back to zero, then to one, and back to zero. And similarly here we come in with n down, zero, then we will have n down one, and back to zero. And now we can <coughs> draw a kind of fat line for all the time intervals where an electron is on the impurity. So we mark all the, uh, the time intervals where we have an electron on the impurity by a fat line or a segment. And this will then give us uh, this so-called segment uh, representation where each uh, segment marks the time interval where the impurity is occupied uh, by an electron. So, like this. And <clears throat> so why is this uh, segment picture useful? The segment picture is useful because it allows us to very efficiently evaluate this trace. Namely, what is this trace? Uh, the local term, the local Hamiltonian, has uh, two, two terms. So H local is U and up and down, minus mu, and up and down. So what, for example, is the chemical potential contribution to this uh, weight? If you think about it for a little moment, you will find that 
this uh, chemical potential contribution is simply given by the length of these segments. So if the total length of these two segments is L up and the length of this segment is L down, then the chemical potential contribution to this uh, trace factor will give us E to the mu times total length of these segments. And what about the interaction contribution? The interaction only acts if the up and down spin is occupied. So up and down spin occupied means we have to look at the intervals where these segments overlap. So each interval where these segments overlap corresponds to a doubly occupied site. So that's where the interaction acts. And we can measure the length of these uh, overlapping regions and call this L overlap. And then we find that this uh, that this uh, trace, trace over D, can be simply expressed as some permutation sign associated with the time ordering of these operators times E to the mu L up plus L down minus U times the length of the overlapping segments. Now S is a permutation sign. And that is very easy to evaluate. So in the uh, program, if you implement this method, you store your configurations as a collection of these segments. And then once you know this collection of these segments, it's very easy to evaluate these uh, quantities, how they overlap, how long they are, and then you uh, very easily get this, uh, this uh, weight factor here. Okay, so then we should uh, discuss a little bit how we actually do the Monte Carlo sampling. So we will do the Monte Carlo sampling in this uh, space of segment configurations and we do it by local updates, which means local uh, changes in the segment configuration such as insertion of a new segment or removal of a segment or yeah, things like that. So that's the strategy for the Monte Carlo sampling. By local updates, I mean removal, insertion removal of segments. Or something I call anti-segment. What is an insertion of a segment and an anti-segment? Let me explain that.
So an insertion of a segment is if we go from a configuration like this, <coughs> like this, so a configuration which has an additional segment like this. That's an insertion of a segment. Or in other words, we insert an operator pair D dagger D. That corresponds to the insertion of a segment. What is the insertion of an anti segment? That is sort of cutting a hole into a segment like this. Let's suppose we have a configuration like this. And I go to a configuration like uh, this. And this corresponds to the insertion of a D, D dagger pair. So the opposite. So here it's D dagger D, here D D dagger. So this inserts a segment, this removes a piece of a segment. Yeah. These two updates are in principle enough to generate all uh, possible configurations. And now we have to uh, have a look at the detailed balance condition. I think Michel uh, talked about Monte Carlo, I think, and explained the basic idea. So we have a, <coughs> a de we must uh, satisfy the so-called detailed balance condition. Sorry? Ah, removal, yes, yes. Yeah, of course, both. Yeah. Yeah, the removal would be then to go from here to here. And the removal of an anti-segment would be from here to here. Yeah. Of course, you have to go both both ways. So what is the, just a very brief reminder, what is the detailed balance condition? It says that uh, the weight, we have to implement our Monte Carlo uh, simulation in such a way that the weight of the configuration C times the probability to go from C to C prime is the same as the weight of the configuration C prime times the probability to go from C prime uh, to C. And in practice, we always split these probabilities into a proposal probability and the acceptance probability. So this will be P proposal, C, C prime, P acceptance, C, C prime, and this will also be a proposal probability to go from C prime to C times an acceptance probability to go from C prime to C. And here we have some freedom how we uh, propose uh, to update these configurations. That's where we can uh, you know, use our intuition a little bit what is a, uh, an um, efficient uh, sampling procedure and then what we want to compute is the ratio of acceptance probabilities and that goes into this uh, metropolis uh, test which determines whether or not the update is accepted. So, so let's look at this insertion of a segment uh, procedure first. So how, <coughs> how should we implement the insertion? One well, one uh, reasonable thing to do is just randomly choose a time for the creation operator. That's the first thing. Choose randomly the creation operator. But then you have to do a test. So if this creation operator you want to uh, place and sub on a segment, 
it means that the impurity is already occupied by an electron. You cannot create another electron. So in that case, you have to uh, reject the update and, yeah, and, and try again. So then we reject the move. We measure again the old configuration and we proceed with maybe some other update. But if <coughs> we are lucky and this creation operator ends up here in this uh, empty space, we actually can create an electron there and now we have to decide where do we put the annihilation operator. <coughs> and, and one reasonable thing to do is the following. So let's assume we were lucky and we are in this situation. This is the old configuration and now we have created our, uh, or we have inserted our dagger operator here. So the question is now where do we place the annihilation operator? And one strategy is to compute now the length of this <coughs> interval here. That is L max. I call this L maximum. That's the maximum length of the interval where I can potentially insert an annihilation operator <coughs> without uh, causing any uh, troubles with the Pauli principle. Or... And then I randomly choose the position of the annihilation operator within this interval of length L max. So what is the proposal probability for this, uh, for this procedure? Can anybody tell me what is, if we follow this recipe, what is the proposal probability for this insertion move? Mm. Yes, yeah, roughly. Yes, more or less. So, so let's, let's see. The proposal probability, uh, P proposal, for this uh, move, say from n sigma segments to n sigma plus one segments, will be. Can anybody see this? Both at the back. Ah, at the back. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll switch to the. So first of all, we have d tau over beta. That is for the probability of placing the creation operator at some specific point on the time interval. And then we have a <clears throat> other factor, which is d tau divided by L max for the probability of placing it within this interval. So. So that will be the proposal probability for this, <coughs> for this insertion. Oh, do I still need this? Maybe I'll let. Yeah, but the full length is not good because. Yeah, you can choose something smaller. Yeah, yeah you have some freedom on how precisely you define this procedure, but one possibility is this. <coughs> mm. 
<coughs> so what about the removal? Now we have to define a procedure to get from here to here. What is a reasonable? Yeah, exactly. Just randomly pick a segment and remove it. Yeah. That's the most obvious uh, thing to do. So in this case, what is the proposal probability uh, to go from a configuration with n sigma plus one segments back to n sigma segments? Well, it's just one over n sigma plus one. So that's the chance that we pick again exactly this segment which we have inserted. <coughs> So now we can <coughs> plug this into this detailed balance condition and then get the ratio of the acceptance probabilities and that is the following. P acceptance to go from n sigma to n sigma plus one. Sigma plus one back to n sigma this is the ratio of proposal probabilities <laughs> times the ratio of the weights. The configuration with n sigma plus one segments times the weight with n sigma segments. Okay, now we plug in these two formulas for the proposal probability. This gives us this factor here. And this comes out like <coughs> beta L max over n sigma plus one. So this is a, this factor de de determine, uh, depends on how precisely you, you do the procedure. And now this <coughs> uh, ratio, well, yeah, so the, here we have to, um, basically we have the ratio of uh, determinants and the change in this uh, local contribution which depends on uh, overlaps and and uh, and uh, change in the length. Yeah. So, uh, so how should I write this? This is sort of determinant n sigma <coughs> n plus one minus one. Oh. And here we have a <coughs> factor d tau squared. And actually here we also had a factor d tau squared, which I forgot. So we have these two factors, d tau here. And then we have <coughs> this uh, change in the weight of the, in the local weight, which is something like minus u times delta L overlap times e to the plus mu times delta L sigma or something like this. And so now you see that these infinitesimal factors, they uh, drop out from this detailed balance uh, condition if we uh, compute the ratio of acceptance probabilities and that is then the quantity you can plug into this metropolis test and draw some random number between zero and one and if this random number is smaller than this uh, expression here you accept the update otherwise you reject it. So 
So that's that's yes. Yeah, you always need the ratio of acceptance probabilities if you do a metropolis uh, sampling. You need exactly this uh, ratio between uh, the the move from n to n plus one and the the backward uh, move. Yes, so this, this is some quantity R. And the acceptance of the move accept insertion with probability something like mean something like this. Mm. Yeah, that's the usual uh, metropolis sampling. Okay, that's it. So with this, uh, we have learned how, <coughs> how this uh, configuration space looks, at least in the case of the single impurity Anderson model. And we have learned how we can, in principle, implement this stochastic sampling in this uh, space of segment uh, configurations. And so, um, in the afternoon. <clears throat> Maybe I should uh, continue with this and tell you how, how we measure physical observables in this uh, algorithm. Actually, that's maybe something we can discuss in just one minute. If you give you one more minute, there are two things we can immediately see from this picture here. Namely, how do we measure, for example, the density of electrons in this type of Monte Carlo sampling. Does anybody? It's just the length. It's you, for each configuration, you measure the length of the segments and you average this length of segments that gives you the density. How do we measure the double occupancy? We just measure the length of the overlap. So it's all very uh, <coughs> intuitive and, and, and simple. And so after, uh, in the next lecture, I want to discuss how do we measure the Green's function in this type of Monte Carlo algorithm. That's a little bit uh, less uh, obvious, but it's important that you know how to measure the Green's function. Then I also want to discuss how this algorithm can be extended to time-dependent retarded interactions because that's important for the uh, method which Silke is discussing or also the uh, dynamically screened interactions which uh, Ferdi, Ariasetti Avan has as, as talked about, and if we have a little bit time uh, at the end, I want to come back then to this uh, formalism and explain why it doesn't have any sign problem. So that's maybe the program for for the for the next uh, session. And so thank you for your attention. and uh, coupling constant, etc. that this method will be better yeah. compared to the... That we the want to take up at the next. Okay, next one. Okay, okay yeah. Yeah. we'll take it up. Really nice yeah. if you can spend a little uh -huh. bit of time okay. because today is the last day <coughs> of the school and I think the students have studied with various kinds of impurity solvers. Okay, yeah, so then I will... Mm -hmm. Okay, then I can start with that. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, I can discuss this. Okay, yeah, I can. I can discuss this, yes. Thank you.